So welcome to the webinar, Birding for Beginners, presented by Benjamin Gantz and hosted by Audubon Society of Central Maryland. Benjamin is a volunteer and board member for our chapter. He has always held a deep fascination with an interest in the natural world, with birds being one of his favorites. He has developed his identification skills over the past several years and is now an avid birder. Benjamin is currently working on earning a Bachelor of Science degree in Biological Sciences from the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. In addition, he has been gaining experience with other agencies and, and organizations, including the Phoenix Wildlife Center, Maryland Department of Natural Resources, and the US Fish and Wildlife Service. Tonight, Benjamin will introduce ASCM's Audrey Carroll and Fred Archibald Sanctuaries in Frederick County which offer good representations of the region's birding. He will discuss the various features that are important to know to make identifications, including size, shape, and plumage variation. A variety of other points will also be considered to give a well-rounded view of birding, including habitat types, Maryland geography, and the seasons of birding. So now I will turn it over to Benjamin. Thank you, Angela. We'll just go ahead and share my screen. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining me today. Uh, today, I will be giving uh, a, a presentation about the wonderful hobby of birding. Whoops, sorry. So what is birding? My definition is actively seeking to observe wild birds and their unique behaviors, often with the goal of making species identifications. And I would consider birding to be a spectrum. So at the one level, you could be pretty casual and simply enjoy the birds that are at your feeders in your backyard or around your neighborhood. You might be kind of in the middle where you travel around to different public lands like parks that are near your house to uh, look at different bird species and identify them and then there's like the extreme where i've heard people will hear about a rare bird that shows up they'll book a flight and go there to see it and add to their life list which a lot of birders have they like to document all of the bird species that they've seen and then after they see that bird they'll go back home so there's definitely quite a spectrum when it comes to birding and um, I would consider birding and bird watching to kind of be interchangeable terms, but um, birding is kind of like a more involved form of bird watching. Like I mentioned before, there's usually a focus on learning the different bird species and identifying them. So I'll go ahead and uh, put out a poll. And it looks like the poll was already put out. So. Looks like you all are from brand new to in intermediate. So hopefully I'll be giving a good overall kind of overview of birding and introducing y'all to it. So there's a multitude of places that can be visited for birding. Uh, there's public lands that can be managed at the federal, state, and local levels. Um, examples of federally managed land they can visit for birding include the National Wildlife Refuges managed by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, state managed lands can include uh, parks that are managed by the Maryland Park Service. And there's also local, locally managed uh, public lands that can be managed at the county level, or in the case of our two Audubon sanctuaries that Angela mentioned earlier, those are also managed at the regional level since it's under our chapter. And like I mentioned earlier, you can also just go birding in your own backyard or neighborhood, which is the nice thing about birding. You don't really have to go that far to enjoy the birds that are around. This is a map that was developed by the Maryland Department of natural resources. It showcases some 
uh, natural areas in particular that can be really good places for birding. And this isn't by all means comprehensive. It doesn't show like all the different regional levels of management that I talked about, but um, it does show some particularly good places. And the nice thing about this map also is that it shows uh, the habitat variation found throughout the state. So in our chapter territory, Carroll County, Howard, Frederick, and some parts of Montgomery County. And you can see it's kind of like a mix of agricultural lands and farmlands, some forests, and then more developed areas, towns and cities. You can see from the key in the diagram. And then you have other types of habitat, um, like more forests out in the western part of the state. And then you have some marshes uh, down on the eastern shore. And these different environment types make for different habitats, which attract different bird species. So like Angela mentioned before, uh, our chapter manages two wildlife sanctuaries in Frederick County. The first is the Audrey Carroll Sanctuary, which was acquired in 1991 from the estate of Audrey Carroll. It's 129 acres and it has a large diversity of habitats, including forest, field, shrub, wetland, and stream. Uh, we have a sanctuary manager who will, who will perform different management techniques at the sanctuaries to provide more habitat to try to have more species of bird and other wildlife in general. And the picture that I have here is of a small wetland that's adjacent to a small pond that we have on the property. Um, we, had, we had a beaver move in uh, about a year ago and it blocked outflow structures on the pond to regulate the water level. And that caused uh, the area to be inundated with water, which made this little wetland. Oftentimes that can be considered problematic in more developed areas, but in our case, um, it, it's quite helpful because it made a new habitat type. And you can see that there's a nice diversity of different uh, wetland plants, grasses, and ferns that are growing. And we also have the Fred Archibald Sanctuary, which we acquired a little more recently in 2002. It's a little bit bigger than Audrey Carroll, and it has a similar um, assortment of habitat types. Um, it has forest, field, shrub, and stream. Um, a little bit less habitat diversity here, but you do have more upland forest, especially in the back part of the sanctuary, uh, where it's more hilly and there's rock outcroppings, and it's a little bit more reminiscent of a little bit farther west, like in Thurmont, where the Catoctin Mountains are. And uh, this picture here is of Virginia bluebells, which grow kind of more in that upland area I was talking about. They're unique because they're a spring ephemeral, which means that they uh, do a lot of their growing earlier in the season before the trees leaf out in the spring so they can utilize the available sunlight before it disappears. And at our sanctuaries, we, our fields um, are planted with native warm season grasses, which provide a good feeding feeding opportunities and shelter for different bird species, especially sparrows that arrive in the winter. So there's a wide variety of habitats found throughout Maryland that attract and sustain diverse bird species. Uh, these include forests, fields and grasslands, shrubs, wetlands, freshwater and shoreline. And for forests, some of the of the representative bird species they can find I include tanagers, flycatchers, warblers, woodpeckers, and vireos. Um, some of these are what we call forest interior dwelling species or FIDS for short. Um, these birds prefer large undisturbed tracts of forest for breeding and just for feeding and being around in general. Uh, the bird pictured here is a great crested flycatcher, which is a summer resident forest interior dwelling species. Uh, they just recently arrived from their wintering grounds, and for our first bird of on count this past weekend, we, we did hear one, so they are arriving. And this picture here is one of those um, natural areas showcased by Maryland Department of Natural Resources. It's the Macemore Hemlock Ravines, a good example of intact forest. It's unique because it has uh, groves of eastern hemlock trees, which are normally found farther north in colder climates, but there is a disjunct population here, along with some other tree species that you would normally find in colder regions. 
And we have fields and grasslands with bird species, including sparrows, bluebirds, meadowlarks, and hawks. Uh, we have a song sparrow pictured here, which um, is a common year round resident bird species. Uh, more than likely, you probably heard one just by being outside. I'll be going over their songs more in depth later when I'm talking about bird song. But um, they are a species that prefers open areas. And I kind of lumped fields and grasslands together, but they are a little bit different. So grasslands generally are more expansive and they're naturally occurring without human influence. And they usually have an assortment of native grasses and other low growing plants, which are native. And then you have fields, which are oftentimes man-made. So Maryland would normally be forest mostly, and there's lots of areas that have been cleared. And after that occurs, then grasses and wildflowers and other shorter plants will come up. And that then that makes fields. And this provides uh, a different habitat type that's needed by certain bird species like sparrows and bluebirds. And we have shrub habitat, which includes species such as thrashers, vireos, wrens, chats, and woodcocks. Um, a lot of the birds that prefer this habitat type, like the white-eyed vireo pictured here, are pretty secretive, and they'll usually hide in the thick tangles of vegetation. But um, the interesting thing about shrub habitats is that it's kind of like an intermediate um, habitat type. And there's a process called succession, which um, is changes in plant communities over time. So if you clear an area and it's just dirt, you'll have grasses and wildflowers and other low-growing plants established first, and then you'll have shrubs come up like pictured here. This picture is from the succession slope at the Audrey Carroll Sanctuary. And then after you get shrubs, you'll get trees that will establish and eventually get large. You'll have young forest and then mature forest after a while. But here at the succession slope, our sanctuary manager will selectively remove uh, trees that get too large. And this is to maintain the shrub habitat, um, which is needed by certain unique bird species like the yellow breasted chat, which I didn't picture here, but uh, they're a very local bird in our region and they're generally not easy to see. And this is a very reliable place to get to see them during the summer. And we have wetlands and freshwater, which is a very diverse habitat type. So wetlands uh, can be very different. You can have small isolated ones like I showed before that was beaver created at the Audrey Carroll Sanctuary, but you can also have much larger, more expansive wetlands, which can be found throughout the state. Um, you can especially get the very large ones over on the Eastern shore where you have large brackish marshes and freshwater marshes. And you get a wide diversity of interesting birds here like waterfowl, herons, egrets, kingfishers, and osprey. And this is a wood duck pictured here, one of our most beautiful birds. And they're interesting because they're a cavity nesting duck species. So they'll nest up in trees like a woodpecker will. Then we have shoreline, which isn't a very common habitat type here in the central Maryland region. Um, it's a lot more common on the Delamarva Peninsula of Eastern Shore and Western shores of the Chesapeake Bay, but you can get them uh, to a limited extent on some of the larger man-made bodies of water in the central Maryland region, like uh, lakes and reservoirs. But uh, you generally get kind of more coastal bird species in this habitat type, like gulls, sandpipers, and plovers. And uh, the bird picture here is a, the bird picture here is a ring-billed gull, which um, is really the only frequent gull species that you'll see in central Maryland. Uh, they are found year round technically, but they're much more frequent during the winter. Uh, they mostly breed up north and they come down um, during the winter. And you'll usually see them in developed areas like parking lots and shopping centers. So more than likely you've probably seen your fair share of them in the past. And Maryland is a very geographically diverse state. You can see that there's different uh, physiographic provinces. There's a coastal plain on the Eastern shore and Southern Maryland. You have the Piedmont, which is where uh, the Central Maryland is and where our chapter territory uh, encompasses. Then you have different uh, mountainous physiographic provinces out in the western part of the state. And these different habitat types make a lot of different 
um, opportunities for different bird species. Um, different birds are attracted to different habitat types found in these different um, areas. On the coastal plant, it's very flat. With sandy soil, you have oak, hickory, and pine forest for the most part. Out in the western part of the state, um, where the elevation is higher, and there's a lot of mountains, um, the climate is cooler. So you get a plant species that you normally find a little bit farther north, like the hemlocks and birches and others. And then we're kind of in the middle ground. We're characterized by a lot of hills. And our forests are predominantly made up of deciduous trees, uh, like oaks, hickories, and ashes. So now it's time to actually talk about birds themselves. So the first aspect of birding that I'll be going over is shape. So there are body features with different shapes depending on the species of bird. These include the bill, legs, wingspan, and the actual body shape. And the shape can change appearance depending on the positions of feathers. So birds can control each feather individually by muscles under their skin. So if they're feeling cold, they'll usually raise their feathers up. This produces a layer of insulating air that traps warmth up, up against the bird's body. And this will make them look much, much more round. And then birds can also do the opposite where um, they'll kind of make themselves look skinny. They'll flatten their feathers down against their body. This can be to keep cool. It prevents the insulating air from getting trapped against their body. It just kind of like dissipates. And they can also do it to kind of look more inconspicuous because they're skinny. So they might be less obvious to a predator like a hawk. So I'll be going over the general kind of like shape over all the different bird groups that you can find here. And I'll use this as an opportunity to introduce uh, many of the birds that we have here in general. So we'll start off with blackbirds, um, which not only includes species that have the word blackbird in their name, like red-winged blackbird. Um, it also includes orioles and grackles. Um, they're medium-sized with a medium-length tail or long tail and a pointed bill generally found in more open areas, but the Orioles are forest species. Um, chickadees, if any of you feed birds, I'm sure you're familiar with them. Small, short tail, very short stubby bill. Uh, very distinctive, they have black and white pattern on their head. And they have a round shape in general. We have two species in Maryland. There's the Carolina chickadee, which is found around here and on the coastal plain and the black cap chickadee, which is found up in the western part of Maryland. They're a colder climate bird, and they're normally found up north, but also in the higher elevations. And we have crows and jays, which are um, pretty easy to identify. I'm sure you all are familiar with them. Uh, they range in size from being medium to large. They often have a medium length tail, medium length bill, and they're just large in general. We have two species of crow. We have common ravens and blue jays, which I'll be going over later. And we have doves, two species in Maryland. Uh, the morning dove, which is a year round common resident. And there's the rock pigeon, which is a uh, very well known common in more developed areas. And they're pretty distinctive. They usually have kind of like a chunky shape, longer tail that can be square or pointed and a distinctive uh, rounded bill shape. And of course, there's ducks, which a lot of people are familiar with, boat-shaped body, webbed feet, uh, oftentimes a broad bill, but that can depend on the species of duck. Some of them are fish eaters and have a narrow bill. And there's also their relatives, the geese and the swans, which are similar overall, but they are larger and have a, a much longer neck. And we have finches, which are kind of a very typical songbird, uh, they're smaller, medium-length tail, and they have a distinctive conical shaped bill that allows them to easily crack seeds, which forms most of their diet. We have a few species around here, um, inclu um, including some of our very common birds like goldfinches and uh, house finches. And we also have the purple finch, which can sometimes arrive during the winter. And flycatchers, there's a lot of different species, but they all have this general body shape. Um, they kind of have like a typical bird profile, medium tail, medium length bill. 
and some of them are very hard to identify. Others are quite easy, like the Phoebe, uh, which bobs its tail up and down constantly. And there's the Eastern Kingbird, which is a, a very vocal, usually apparent species that's out in the open. And there's game birds, which there's not many representative species in Maryland. Um, the main one you would really only see in our region in the central part of the state is the wild turkey, which is our largest land bird. Um, there are rough grouse, but they're up in the western part of the state. Again, a bird that prefers colder climates that's restricted to those higher elevations. And then you also get northern bobwhite quail, which unfortunately are very localized. Uh, they've suffered serious population declines over the years, and you can only really see them in specific places where the habitat is correct. And there's gulls and terns, um, not too common or diverse in our region. The ring-billed gull, like I mentioned before, uh, you can see often in the winter. Uh, the other gulls and the terns, you mostly see in the Chesapeake Bay and on, over on the eastern shore. But they have a distinctive shape. The gulls have a medium length bill that's kind of hooked at the end. And it has an angle on the bottom, which is called a genigial um, arch. And they have long wings, webbed feet, and the turns are similar. The gulls are actually a close relative, but they have a pointed bill and longer, more pointed wings. And then we have hawks and falcons, which generally are pretty. Uh, easy to identify. They have a pretty well-known appearance overall. Uh, most of them are larger. There are some smaller species. Although they are similar, falcons have pointed wings and hawks have rounder wings. And they are similar in appearance, but they're not very closely related. But they have um, a similar lifestyle of being an active predator of other vertebrates. So um, they do have similar appearances, but they're not very closely related, which is Kind of interesting. We have herons, which are quite diagnostic. We have two species around here. We have the great blue heron, which is large and common, and then the green heron, which is about the size of a crow. Other species they can find on the eastern shore, but overall they have the similar body shape with an S-curved neck, long pointed bill that they use for spearing fish and other prey, and uh, long legs that they use for wading through the water. Uh, hummingbirds, which I'm sure all of you can probably identify, very tiny, long, thin bill uh, that they use for drinking nectar from flowers, uh, angular wings that are beat really fast, so fast that they look like a blur and create the humming sound, which gives them their name. And there's kingfishers. There's one species here in Maryland, and it's the only species in North America, actually, that's widespread. There are two others, but they're restricted to the Rio Grande Valley down in South Texas. But the belted kingfisher that we have is very distinctive. Um, they're about the size of a small crow. They have a crest, long pointed bill. And the males have a single blue band on their breast while the females have an additional brown band below that. Nuthatches are another pretty well-known group of birds. Um, again, if any of you feed birds at home, you're likely to have these guys stop by often. Um, they're easy to identify because um, they usually will creep head down the trunk of a tree or branches, but they also have a long pointed bill. They'll hold their neck out horizontal to their body. Uh, they're pretty small, shorter bill. And then there's owls, which are very distinctive. Um, pretty much every species that we have in Maryland is distinct. The only unfortunate thing though is that you don't get to see them very often because they're strictly nocturnal. But they all have a similar body shape overall, rounded head. Some have ear tufts, some have don't, but they all have large forward pointing eyes. And we do have a few species of shorebird here in central Maryland, not too many, but the few that we, we do have, they, um, they're similar to all the other shorebird species in body plan. Uh, they generally kind of have a teardrop shaped body, long bill, longer neck, long legs. And they have pointed wings that they generally flap really fast when they're flying. Um, we have the kill deer, which is a species of plover they can find in open areas, as well as some other bird species, uh, sorry, some other uh, shore bird species uh, that you can get here, like spotted sandpiper and solitary sandpiper. But the shorebirds are a 
kind of a challenging group, but there thankfully are easier to identify species around here in central Maryland. And sparrows are similar to finches. Uh, they're a medium-sized songbird. Uh, they also have a conical bill for cracking seeds. Uh, it's a little bit smaller though. Uh, they have a long tail. A lot of different species that can be found um, throughout different types times of the year, depending on the species. Some of them are kind of tri tricky to identify. So if you get into birding more, um, that's definitely a little bit more of a challenging one that you'll probably uh, kind of get more familiar with in identifying. And there's thrushes. Um, I'm sure you all are familiar with one of this thrush species, the American robin. And there's also other species as well around here, like the wood thrush and the hermit thrush. Um, they all have this same body sh shape overall. They're medium sized, kind of have a typical bird silhouette, medium length bill, longer tail. And there's swallows and swifts, which are called aerial insectivores. So they spend most of their time flying and they'll grab flying insects and eat them in the air. The silhouette here is of a barn swallow, which is the only swallow species that we have, which has a deeply forked tail. The other swallow species have a shorter square shaped tail. And the swifts are similar to swallows overall in their body shape and in their habits by spending most of their time in the air. But they're actually not related to swallows, kind of like with hawks and falcons. They're actually more, their closest relatives are hummingbirds. And they're the only birds other than hummingbirds that beat their wings in a figure eight configuration, which is pretty interesting. But they have more of a cigar shaped body and very um, shallow, rapid, stiff wing beats. And we have warblers, which I consider to like the cream of the crop when it comes to birds that birders look for. Um, there's a lot of different beautiful species that have a lot of different colors and patterns. Uh, the males during the breeding season in particular will show these colors off, but they can also be challenging because they molt out of these um, plumages during the fall. And then females and immature birds often look a bit different. So it, they're a bit challenging, but there's also a lot of really um, pretty colors. So they're pretty attractive to birders of all levels, but they all have this similar body plan overall. They're kind of plump, uh, thin pointed bill that they use for uh, grabbing insects from leaves and twigs, medium like tail, and they're very active. Um, they're one of the harder birds to get pictures of if you're a photographer. And woodpeckers are very distinct. Uh, we have quite a few species here in Maryland. Um, they're readily identifiable by their general um, kind of elongated body shape. Uh, there's sharp chisel shaped bill that they use for drilling into wood or tapping. And they have a stiff prop shaped tail that they use to support themselves when they're up against wood. And some species that we have are the hairy woodpecker, downy woodpecker, northern flicker, red-bellied woodpecker, the pileated woodpecker. And we also have wrens, which are usually associated with people. You can find them in towns on suburban areas, they'll usually often nest like on your porch and old boots, flower pots, and pretty much any other place they can find. But they're pretty distinct. They have a long, what's called a decurved bill that curves downwards. And they have a tail that they hold up at an angle almost all the time. And these are just a few pictures to kind of showcase the variation that birds have in their body shape, like for the little blue heron with that long S-shaped neck and the long pointed bill, mallard, typical boat shaped body of a duck, and the song sparrow, which is doing what I mentioned before, where it's fluffing its feathers out to stay warm so it, it looks really plump. And it could also make itself look much thinner if it wanted to. This is a good example of how you can use shape to distinguish between two bird species that are commonly encountered. So we have two vulture species, the turkey vulture and the black vulture. Now the turkey vulture, when it's soaring, um, it'll hold its wings in what's called a dihedral, which is a shallow D shape. And then the black vulture will hold its wings out um, straight. And you can see that the black vulture also has a rounded trailing silhouette 
the turkey vulture has a more angular trailing silhouette. And turkey vultures, well, this doesn't really have to do with the shape, but it's just helpful to know for the two. Um, turkey vultures generally fly lower to the ground and they teeter back and forth. And black vultures generally fly up higher and they um, will fly pretty level. They don't really teeter. And the interesting thing about black vultures is that they're actually a relatively new bird in Maryland. They formerly only occurred north to North Carolina, but over the past couple of decades, they've been expanding their range north and now they're found throughout Maryland and up into the southern New England states. The next aspect of birding that's helpful to be familiar with is size. So birds occur in a multitude of sizes depending on the species. In Maryland, they range in size from the diminutive ruby-throated hummingbird, our smallest bird, to species like the bald eagle, where females can have a seven-foot wingspan and weigh over 12 pounds. And then you have wild turkeys, which are, are our largest land bird. Uh, the males can reach weights of up around 14 pounds. And this is just a scale to uh, show the relative sizes of some more common birds. Um, it's very helpful to be familiar with this. So if you see a bird that you're not really familiar with and you want to identify it, um, you can kind of get a, you can know like what size it is compared to other bird species. So you, if you see something, you can be like, oh, it's about the size of a robin, or it's a little bit bigger than a sparrow, or it's a little bit smaller than a crow. So knowing that's definitely very helpful. And there's also some uh, size extremes that aren't depicted on this illustration, like um, hummingbirds and kinglets and gnat catchers are smaller than sparrows, and the eagles and turkeys and swans are all bigger than geese. And this is um, an instance where it's helpful to know difference in size between species to identify them. Two of our woodpeckers that we have the downy woodpecker and the hairy woodpecker are very similar in appearance, but the hairy woodpecker is a bit larger. So this is the main thing you can use to tell them apart, because you can, as you can see, um, the patterning and coloration is very similar between the two species. And on the hairy woodpecker, the bill is proportionately longer than the downy woodpecker. But it's definitely the most important to know the, to know the size difference between the two. And you also have crows and ravens. So the interesting thing about ravens is that formerly they only occurred out in western Maryland, where it's more mountainous and a little bit cooler, like how how like how I was explaining earlier. But they've been expanding their range eastward over the years, and they're a lot more frequent now. And they've even been recorded nesting east in the Baltimore City area, but they're readily distinguishable from crows by their larger size. Um, and you can see some other differences as well. Like the raven has a much larger, um, kind of like knife shaped bill and they have shaggy throat feathers as well. And you can't tell from this picture, but ravens also have a wedge shaped tail, whereas crows have a squared off tail. And ravens will often soar with their wings stretched out and not moving them at all. Whereas crows will never do this. They'll sometimes glide with like their wings tucked up, but they will never soar like a hawk or a vulture, which is what ravens do. Another important aspect of birding is, is color and pattern. So there's a multitude of feather colors and patterns uh, for different species of birds. Um, there can be differences in the appearance uh, between males and females and juveniles of the same bird species. And it's also possible for individual birds of the same species to change their appearance depending on the time of year. So this kind of just gives a nice little overview of the diversity and color and pattern between different bird species. Um, there are some on here like the golden crown sparrow and the Oregon subspecies of the dark I junko that aren't found around here, they're out west. But um, a lot of these birds do occur around here, like red bellied woodpecker, the hairy and downy woodpeckers that I mentioned earlier, uh, American goldfinches. And then there's a few birds on here, like the purple finch and the red breasted nuthatch and the pine siskin, 
which are known as eruptional species. So they're normally found farther north and they'll normally stay there throughout the winter. Um, there's usually a steady food supply. Um, they'll normally feed on the seeds of different conifer trees like pines and spruce, but some winters uh, there isn't enough to sustain them. So they move farther south than normal. Uh, so they can make their way down to Maryland and other more southern states. And this provides more of an opportunity to see more bird species. And this past winter in particular was a really good eruptional year. We actually had two purple finches at our first bird of on count at the Fred Archibald Sanctuary this past weekend. So they're still around. And I did hear a red breast in that hatchet a few weeks ago as well. And here's just a showcase of color and pattern variation between some common bird species that you all are probably familiar with, two of these at least. Um, they have the blue bird. You can see that they're not all blue. They also have distinctive chestnut and white coloration underneath. Uh, the blue jay, very distinctive color and pattern overall. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with them. And we have the white-throated sparrow, which as you would guess by the name, they have a characteristic white throat, which is a good thing to look for uh, when identifying them. These are a winter resident species only. So they're starting to move out of here now to go to breeding grounds farther north. And I mentioned earlier that there can be differences between male and female and juvenile within a single species. And uh, bluebirds are a good example of this. You can see that the male has much more vivid blue coloration um, on his back and wings and on the head. And females and immatures, in contrast, instead of being bright blue on top, they're much more of a grayish brown. And immature birds are birds that can be uh, either male or female, but they look the same because of their age. And the males will molt out of these dull feathers as they get older into their more colorful breeding plumage, like what's shown here. And then you have juvenile birds, which are younger than immatures. And they're generally birds that have more recently left the nest. They're past the fledgling stage. And here you can see the distinctive spotting that young bluebirds have. And here's an example of a contrast that you can have between two members, two sexes of the same species. You can see that the female red-winged blackbird almost looks like a sparrow with all of its streaking. But if you learn the specific pattern and the coloration overall, along with some other physical features like the larger size, and the pointed bill, you can identify them as being a red-winged blackbird. You can see the male is very different. Glossy black overall with the characteristic red wing patches, which are known as epaulets. And so this is kind of an interesting um, aspect of color and pattern. So the, for the red-winged blackbird male, this can change. Um, they can actually cover up the epaulette and you'll just see this yellow stripe and then they can also pull the black feathers back and make the red show if they want to like show off to other males if they're displaying. And if they want to be peaceful, they'll cover it up and then you'll just see the yellow stripe. So it may not look like a red-winged blackbird when you see it, but it is. And here's just another example of color and pattern differences. We have two Oriole species here, the Baltimore Oriole, which I'm sure y'all are familiar with, bright orange underneath, and then you have the Orchard Oriole which is a less well-known species around here. And they are a burnt orange color instead of the bright orange of the Baltimore Oriole. And I also mentioned earlier that um, you can have differences in plumage for a single species, depending on the time of year. And the ducks are a good example of this. So you can see here, that male mallards during the breeding season, they have that characteristic iridescent green head and the white neck ring. But then once the breeding season is over, they'll molt out into a much more dull coloration and they look like a pretty different bird. And this applies to all the other, or almost all the other ducks that we have here in North America. Um, ducks in tropical regions of the world like South America, they retain their colorful breeding plumage year round but here they do change depending on the time of year.
So those are all the physical attributes with birds that you can look for. I tried to select um, good representative examples to give you all a good introduction. So now we'll move into range maps, which is another helpful aspect of birding. So certain bird species may be found in Maryland year round during migration only or only during summer or winter. And the seasonality can also depend on the location in the state for some of the species. So the range map on the left, you can see it's for the morning dove. This is a common year round resident in Maryland. And you can see that uh, by looking at the, uh, the colors on the legend, which will be the same for all the range maps that I'm gonna show. And then for the Baltimore Oriole, you can see that we're in their summer range only. They'll arrive during spring migration. Um, we did get Baltimore Oriole at the Fred Archibald Sanctuary last weekend. So they are arriving and they'll stay to breed for the summer and then they'll move back down south during fall migration. And the white throated sparrow, which I mentioned earlier, um, they're a winter resident species. And you may be thinking that Maryland's kind of a weird place for birds to be wintering since it still gets kind of cold. But a lot of these birds breed pretty far north where it gets even more frigid during the winter. So compared to there, it's a bit more mild here during the winter. So it is suitable for them uh, to spend the winter season. That's the case for the white throated sparrow. And there's the magnolia warbler, which is th this range map is a good representation of a uh, migratory species in general. So they'll usually just move through Maryland on their way to their northern breeding grounds. And you can see in the range map here that some of the summer range actually extends down to Appalachian Mountains, and some of it is in uh, far western Maryland. And this is actually a pretty common trend for a lot of warbler species. Um, they breed up in colder climates, but because of the higher elevations in western Maryland and the cooler climate, they will actually breed there. But for the most part, uh, magnolia warblers and other migratory warblers uh, can only be found throughout most of the state during migration season. And this is an example of how the seasonality can actually depend on which part of the state that you're in. So for gray catbirds, they're found year round on the Delamarva Peninsula or the Eastern Shore and along the Western Shore. But once you get into our region, Central Maryland, as well as Western Maryland, um, they're only found during the summer. So you can actually occasionally get catbirds here in the middle of winter. And the main reason for this is that the climate on the eastern shore and along the western shore is moderated. It's a little bit milder, uh, mainly due to influences from the Chesapeake Bay and the Atlantic Ocean. So for all of these examples, it's very helpful to know um, which birds will be present at different times of the year. Because if you see one that you may think you know what it is, but then you also know that it shouldn't be there around that time of the year, it will help guide you because you know that's probably a different species. And voice uh, can be a very helpful way to identify birds. Um, there is a difference between bird song and bird call. So songs are generally more drawn out and complex. Um, they're usually for one or, or one of two reasons. Um, the first is defending territory. Um, the males will do it to announce that they kind of own the area and for other members of the same species to stay away because they want the resources in that area to themselves for raising a brood. And the song can also be for a male bird to attract a female. And you also have calls which are generally much shorter and simpler than song. Um, they can be given for multiple reasons, um, such as an alarm call to let other birds know that there's danger, or it could be a contact call between members of the same species. And it's definitely more of an advanced birding skill, learning the voice. Um, along with a song for many birds, you can have multiple calls that sound a little bit different. And then you can have similar sounding calls and song between different species, so it can get kind of complicated. 
but it's definitely something good to look into if, if you get into birding. So these are spectrograms, which allow the visualization of um, the sound waves that a bird produces when it sings or calls. Um, I have one for both the song and the call of the song sparrow, which I mentioned before, a common bird that you've likely heard. And you can see here that the song is a lot more complicated and drawn out than the, the single note of the call. And learning these different um, aspects of a, bird of a bird's voice can help with identification. And here's a few more examples of spectrograms. First one's from a wood thrush, which has a really uh, rich fluted song. I think it's one of the nicest bird songs that we have around here. And then there's a Carolina chickadee um, song spectrogram. You can see the big difference uh, between the different uh, bird species with how the notes appear. And having this visual reference can be really helpful if you're learning calls. So I've sometimes tried to learn bird song just by listening to a recording like 20 times and it usually doesn't work out because I just forget it anyway. But if you're more of a visual learner like I am, um, you can uh, remember what the different notes kind of look like and the sound that's associated with it. So that can really help with a gang blurred bird voices better. And it also helps to get out in the field and hear birds in person as well. This is a really good example of using voice to distinguish between two species. So we have two species of crow here in Maryland. We have the American crow, which gives that distinctive call, call, call that I'm sure everybody has heard. And we also have the fish crow, which gives a very high nasally sound it sounds very different. If you get to hear both out in the field, you'll definitely um, not mix them up and you'll be able to identify both from that point forward. But it's kind of interesting, the spectrograms for these two actually look pretty similar by the way that the notes appear, but they are very different when you hear it. And American crows are very widespread. You can find them in pretty much any open area. They're found throughout the lower 48 states pretty much. And the fish crow has a much more restricted range. It's confined to kind of areas near the coast and along larger river systems, but they will also be found in just kind of more open areas like towns, open woodlands, places like that. But they still have a restricted range. But they are still pretty common in our region. And I know this is an introduction to birding presentation, but I figured I'd kind of introduce um, some challenging aspects if you do get into birding. So there are certain birds uh, that can have really similar appearance overlap, like warblers and flycatchers and sparrows. Um, here you have a female common yellow throat. And I mentioned earlier that the male warblers are usually easier to identify than females. In the case of the yellow throat, uh, the males have a distinctive black mask on their head. And then we have, when you have the female, which doesn't have that, um, she has a similar appearance to immature or female Nashville warblers, a similar overall appearance. And then you have these flycatchers. Uh, there's several more that look like this. Um, they're called Empidinax flycatchers, and they're super tricky. You basically can't tell them apart by looking at them. You have to listen to their voice to distinguish them. And the sparrows can be kind of tricky too. We have the song sparrow, which is that common one that I've talked about a couple times. And there's the savannah sparrow. Um, but generally, you get song sparrows because they're much more common, less picky about their habitat. You can find them in brushy areas along woodland edges and in forests themselves, as long as there's enough shrubs and in fields. And you can also get them in suburban areas as well. They'll sometimes come to feeders. Whereas savanna sparrows are very picky. They like expansive grasslands with grasses that are ankle height about. So it's also helpful to know about the bird's habits 
when um, you're when you're trying to identify them. And there are a multitude of helpful burning apps that will help you um, make identifications. There's eBird, which is really great for logging the species that you see out in the field. Um, you can enable the app to track your movement as well as the time and distance traveled. Um, I included a map from one of our sanctuary counts here. You can see the route that we took back then. And then you also get to put down all the different bird species you were able to identify either by sight or by hearing them. And uh, here's a checklist that we had for one of our sanctuary counts a while ago. And then there's the Merlin ID app, uh, which is very helpful. Um, you can see here at the bottom, uh, there's an identification process that you can go through. If you see a bird that you're not um, sure what it is, you can go through these steps and you, it'll help you make an identification. And there's also um, the option to explore birds. Um, the GPS will zoom in, or I guess kind of go into where you are specifically. And then it'll give you an exact list of the birds that are most likely to be around. And it also shows the different times of year that they're likely to be present. And each species has a profile that shows multiple pictures showing differences between males, uh, females, immatures, and juveniles, along with a range map and spectrograms of the songs and calls. So it's kind of like everything that I've talked about in the one, and it's a really useful resource uh, for using for birding. And there's other official apps as well. There's one. Um, that's been developed by the National Audubon Society, as well as some others. I don't have experience with them, but I would definitely recommend eBird and the Merlin ID app. And eBird is how you record lists of birds that you see in your neighborhood, your backyard, for our upcoming uh, bird a event this weekend. So that's a good opportunity to familiarize yourself with the app if you haven't um, used it. Yeah. And there's different seasons of birding. There's spring and fall migration, which is kind of the most exciting. Um, there's what I call the summer doldrums, which as you might expect from the name isn't too exciting. And there's wintering species as well. During spring and fall migration, uh, there's a lot of species that breed farther north that pass through Maryland. Uh, these mainly include songbirds such as warblers and vireos, which I've discussed. And migratory species can be found in many places. So you, you don't have to go to like a big uh, public land area uh, to see a lot of migrating birds. Um, you can also find them in smaller forests and woodlots that might be in your neighborhood or in a local park. Um, migrating birds don't need to set up a territory uh, to get resources to raise their brood. Um, so you can get a lot of them crammed into a relatively small area because they're just kind of moving through and trying to get food as they go. So that makes migration season really exciting because you kind of never know what's going to show up where. I had a black throated green warbler uh, singing from my backyard the other day. And this also makes it um, exciting for the upcoming birdathon event because you might uh, get some cool stuff in your backyard or a nearby woodlot. And this is the main reason why I think people, um, birders especially, really love warblers a lot. There's so many different uh, beautiful colors and patterns between breeding males. All of these species, except for the black pole warbler, follow that common trend of being present as a migrant um, throughout the state most of the year. Or sorry, only being present throughout most of the state during migration, but you can find them up in the higher elevations in the western part of the state. And we have gotten all of these over the years at our sanctuary counts. And then there's the summer doldrums, where migratory species have passed through and they're in their northern breeding grounds, and resident species that finish nesting 
so the residents like goldfinches and robins and blue jays and morning doves, um, since they don't have to migrate, they'll take advantage of the extra time that they have and they'll nest earlier in the season so that they can get a head start and they're young or are already hatched out and growing um, earlier in the season. But this is usually finished up by the time you reach the peak of summer. And these factors along with hot weather leads to less bird activity overall. But you can still get good birding opportunities during the summer, especially if you get out during dawn or dusk, with dawn being the best. Um, and I just have a few um, pictures of common birds that are found year round uh, that you can see pretty easily, including the quintessential rock pigeon that I'm sure you all know and are familiar with. We have the red-winged blackbird, which we talked about before. Um, they're kind of a wetland specialist. They don't need a really big wetland, though. If you have a roadside ditch with some cattails or a willow thicket, you can also get them breeding in there, too. And they will also sometimes use overgrown fields for nesting, like at our Audubon sanctuaries. And you also have the morning dove, common year-round resident. And we have wintering species. Um, there's a lot of different birds that breed farther north and will spend the winter in Maryland. Like I mentioned before, um, examples include waterfowl in particular, but there's also sparrows like the white throated sparrow I was talking about earlier, and there's the kinglets, which I will um, talk about in a little bit. So one of the highlights of winter birding in our region is definitely the wintering waterfowl. So a lot of these species breed in what's called the prairie potholes region up in the northern Great Plains. And then during the winter, they migrate south um, and they'll distribute along generally kind of coastal regions along the Gulf and up along the Atlantic. But um, they're, they're generally easy to see as long as you have a large enough body of water. They're the most common on some of the larger marshes and tributaries of the Chesapeake Bay and the bay itself. But you can also get them on sizable man-made bodies of water in central Maryland, like reservoirs and lakes. Um, some of these species, like the bufflehead and the hooded merganser, um, are quite common locally. And these pictures were taken at the Piney Run Reservoir. And you also have the redhead duck and tundra swans, which you can sometimes find in our region. Uh, they'll usually just pass, they'll usually just pass through though during migration season they're generally abundant um, in the bay and the nearby wetlands um, that are on the eastern shore but as i was um, explaining earlier about the ducks with their eclipse plumage um, they become colorful when they're here for the winter which is nice they're all um, dolled up and pretty when they're here for the winter makes them easier to identify um, and this is because um, the males, which are called drakes, will um, court and pair up with females during the wintering season, and then they fly back to their nesting grounds after they pair up, where the males will molt out into their more dull eclipse plumage, and then they molt back into their colorful feathers when they're ready to migrate back um, to their wintering grounds. And here's a few more wintering birds that we can get. I uh, like the red-breasted nuthatch, which is one of the eruptional species that I was talking about earlier. Swamp sparrow, um, which isn't just found in swamps and marshes. You can also find them in overgrown fields. Um, they're pretty similar to some of the other sparrows, like song sparrows that I talked about. But there's no streaking on the breast. And there's some other distinguishing characteristics as well like different patterning on the head. And we have golden crown kinglets and a second kinglet species called the ruby crown kinglet, which are super tiny. And they're only present during the wintering season. Um, they're similar to warblers in that they're very active and move around all the time. And if you're a photographer, it can be difficult to get a close look at them. And we have the yellow-bellied sapsucker, which is really the only winter resident woodpecker that we get. And as you might guess from the name, they do drink sap. That's their main uh, diet. They'll drill 
um, these intricate holes into the bark of trees and then sap will flow out. And this not only provides a uh, source of food for the sap suckers, but other birds like warblers and hummingbirds will also visit these to drink the sugar, yeah, the sugar rich um, sap that flows out. And this is kind of another more advanced birding topic, but I thought it'd be cool to share with you all. Um, there is a possibility of getting rare birds. So birds are very mobile, being able to fly and travel long distances. So they can sometimes end up way far out where they're supposed to be, like the Western Grebe, which as you might guess from the name is from the Western United States. Um, this pair was actually found in Loch Raven Reservoir over in Baltimore County. So you don't always have to travel too far um, if there's a rare bird that shows up. And if you get into the birding loop, um, you'll usually be you'll usually be able to find out some way or another that there's a rare bird around somewhere. And the Mississippi kite is a southern raptor. They're similar to black vultures, like I mentioned before, how they expanded their range northwards. And Mississippi kites are basically doing the same thing. Um, they were just recently documented um, nesting in southern Maryland for the, the very first time over the first couple of years. So they'll, they will probably become more common as the years go on. The very thrush, really beautiful bird native to the Pacific coast of North America. One showed up in um, St. Mary's County about a year ago. And the Eurasian widgeon is interesting because they are normally found in Europe and Asia, but they will make their way over here to North America during the winter. And they can actually be um, pretty reliable to see. During the wintering season, you just have to go to the right spot. And there's a couple of other birds that do this as well, like the lesser black backed gull. And that is everything. I hope that this was a good introduction for you all to birding. And uh, hopefully I encouraged you to get out and uh, make a checklist and hopefully you'll participate in our upcoming Birdathon event this weekend. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much for that informative presentation. And I want to go ahead and remind our participants that you can put your questions for Benjamin in the Q&A box, which you'll find um, down at the bottom of your screen. Um, and so question for you, Benjamin, um, and if you, you can come back on camera if you'd like. Um, what do you recommend um, in terms of how to learn um, identification and songs and calls. You mentioned a few apps. Um, are there any websites and what's the web best way to, to go about? Um, so the Merlin app that I mentioned earlier is a really good resource. It has the songs and calls for all the different birds that you can find in your specific location. But the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, All About Birds website is also a good place to learn. Um, you can play calls there as well. All right. Um, uh, we have a question. It's not necessarily specific to birding, but um, how do you attract hummingbirds to your yard? Um, and I would say to plant native plants that they like. Um, uh, coral honey, honeysuckle is one. Um, any type of plants like that that um, offer the nectar that they seek. Do you have anything to add to that? Um, I was going to mention that. The trumpet honeysuckle that you mentioned that's really helpful. I have a couple plants in my backyard. Hummingbirds are always going to that and putting up hummingbird feeders is also helpful. Um, and how do you keep away starlings and sparrows from your feeders? Um, it's kind of impossible to keep uh, them away 100%. I have heard in the past that putting out safflower um, is kind of discouraging to house sparrows and starlings. And they sell special suet feeders that have the cake um, face down. And that's more awkward for starlings to get at. But woodpeckers and other native birds don't mind hanging upside down. 
but I've heard that it doesn't work 100% of the time, but I'm sure it will help to an extent. It's probably worth experimenting with. And do you have a um, particular spark bird or was there one particular species that really got you into birding? Um, it's hard to say because I've been interested in birds for basically as long as I can remember. But I would say that waterfowl, um, ducks in particular, are probably my favorite. Okay, cool. Um, and there's a question about um, our sanctuaries and um, if people are allowed to visit, you have to belong. Um, and our, our sanctuaries, they're privately owned, but they are open to the public. Um, we ask that you don't bring your dogs and don't bring things like ATVs, but otherwise, um, yeah, they're, they're open to anyone who wants to visit. Um, we do have nature walks there once a month. Um, we have been having registration for those due to COVID um, and they do tend to fill up really quickly. So I would uh, just watch our social media sites and our newsletter for notice of those and then try to sign up um, as soon as you can. What birds walk up and down trees? Um, there's several. Uh, the brown creeper is a winter resident bird that's really small. Uh, they have a longer tail and a curved bill, but what they'll do is they'll start at the bottom of, of a tree and then they'll kind of like creep up incrementally and go up branches or maybe just the main trunk and then they fly down to another tree down to the bottom and then work their way up again. And they basically just do that all the time. But you also have nuthatches that will go down trees head first and woodpeckers will crawl up or down trees most of the time. And how and where can we see owls? Owls? Yes. Um, owls are really tricky to get. Um, I'd say your best bet is if you have like a public land, like a park that you're able to go to um, after dark, like at dusk or during dawn, um, you have a pretty decent chance of hearing one. When we do our bird counts at the sanctuaries, we always start at six o'clock in the morning um, in case there's any owls calling. We'll sometimes get great horned owls and barred owls. Yeah, and, and I've, uh, I've also heard bar, barred owls, at least at Audrey Carroll, um, even a little bit later in the morning too, sometimes. Yeah, you can sometimes get them calling during the day as well. Yeah. And are bicycles okay at the sanctuaries? Um, I do not believe we, I don't think I've ever been asked that, but I do not believe we allow um, bicycles and they're not really conducive to bikes anyway. Um, some of the areas are pretty grassy. Um, they can get muddy and stuff, so. Wait one minute to see if any more questions pop in. Um, and we are recording the presentation, so if you want to watch it again or if you know someone that um, missed it, just look for the recording in your email. Um, we will send that to everyone who has registered. That's barring any technical difficulties with putting the recording together. Um, so just go ahead and look for that link. Um, do birds have lifelong mates? Um, it depends on the species. Some of them do like geese and then others will just pair up for the breeding season. And then you have others like ducks, which will just like stay together for a short time and the male will leave after the female starts incubating the eggs. So there's a lot of variation. All right. I think that is about all the questions that we have. Um, so I want to thank you again for the informative presentation um, and I want to uh, thank everyone who registered um, and uh, just stay tuned to our social media ch channels and our newsletter to hear of any more upcoming webinars or other events. So that's it for now. Thank you everyone and have a good night. Thank you.